Thanks, David, and good morning, everyone. Um, so, as probably most of you are aware, that during our Sunday services, we've been working through the Gospel of Luke, um, and that um, when you look at the Gospel, it narr narratively speaking, it kind of hit the climax of the story. We kind of hit the climax of the story last week with the Easter events. Um, which we were able to celebrate together and celebrate with family and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and that was for the disciples. So, like, Lorraine had us in a place of imagination. I want to bring us back into there to, um, for us to think, to imagine what that week was like for the disciples. That was a, um, the, the crucifixion was a culmination um, of a rather busy and action-packed week so i just want to do a real brief recap of that week the disciples experience now i put them in day one day two but some of the days may be a bit um um juggle around depending on which which gospel you read which um historical scholar that you ref reference that kind of stuff but this is a kind of rough average like rough um breakdown of that easter week so it started with day one so that would be Palm Sunday, um, what, we, what we call Palm Sunday now. Um, that was Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Um, his, he and his disciples were greeted by cheering crowds and supporters and everyone saying Hosanna and just really praising and, and cheering him as they entered the, the city. And I can imagine, at least for the special disciples, it was probably an awesome moment just to see all these people come out and, and cheer um, Jesus as he entered and feeling like they, they get it, that he is, the, he is the Messiah, he's the one that's come to, to save us and to rescue us. So great day, day one. Let's bring it to day two. Um, during day two, now, so throughout this week, Jesus is continuing to teach to crowds, he's teaching at the temple he's he's speaking to the people and that kind of stuff. and but in day two jesus com was confronted um with the corruption of the merchants and the money changers who were price gouging worshippers by selling animals that were going to be used as sacrificial offerings so they were basically charging foreigners who come to the temple to worship passover because passover was going to be at the end of this week and part of the, the ritual was they come and they present a sacrificial offering um, at the temple. And so they had merchants who were just charging exorbitant fees. Like, we know what happens when fuel prices go up here when during a long weekend and, and that kind of stuff. But um, so they were kind of doing the same, charging an exorbitant fee, basically charging for people to worship. I can't imagine the uproar if, if we decided to, to just charge everyone that, that came into our building a fee for entering entering the building entering the temple um it would it was just shocking and jesus he didn't want to have it and so he did that whole um clearing of the temple where he turned over the temple uh, so translation he made a whip to to um get them out so that would have been another amazing thing that happened that week the day that that jesus wow he got angry, righteously angry, and he tossed everyone out of the temple because they were defiling it. They were defiling a house of worship and a house, um, a house of prayer with bartering and their cheating and their scamming, basically. Um, and that was definitely going to be a topic of conversation, I would imagine, amongst the disciples, not to mention amongst the wider community as this, this, um, this upstart from Nazareth came and just tossed everyone out of the temple. Um, that brings us to day three. Um, that was the confrontation with the Jewish leaders. There's more than one account in the Gospels where Jesus' authority was questioned to his face by the Jewish leaders. And there were times, and it was during these times that Jesus not so subtly threw shade um, right back at them. So I think it was safe to say in this week that there was tensions was beginning to run high as Jesus and his disciples were kind of like pushing back against um, what the Jewish leaders and the religious leaders were demanding and expecting of them and on, of the Jewish people. Um, which leads to day four when Jesus, Judas 
agrees to betray Jesus. So none of the disciples, as far as we're aware, were um, at, right at that moment aware of Judas's betrayal. Um, during this time, Jesus was still teaching and being followed by the crowd. Um, and it was causing a great concern for the Pharisees. Um, and I can imagine that for Jesus' disciples, that ministering to the people in such numbers, seeing them want to learn more from their teacher, it would have been just a great moment, like a, like a, a great adrenaline rush, especially as they're coming up to the eve of the Passover. That's like the, the religious event for the, on the Jewish council, um, the, the Jewish calendar. Um, during the time is the Passover feast. Um, if you want to equate it to what we celebrate, it's like, well, Easter, but it's also like Christmas for us where like there's a whole big build up, even for people that don't um, practice the Christian faith, there's a whole big build up to Christmas where like everyone's getting ready for this day with family day with friends where they're going to celebrate. And so that probably was the same sort of ramp up intention that we experience now for like Christmas that they were experiencing right there in the preparation for Passover. Which brings us to day five, which was the Last Supper, um, the Passover feast, a great celebration, which was immediately followed by Jesus being arrested and taken into custody and by the by the by the Jewish leaders, the betrayal from one of their own. So they got the the the, the ultimate high, the, the the climax of the week, and then kind of like went away, and Jesus was taken away, and he was arrested, and they were known to be his followers. That was followed like day six, which is what we call Good Friday, the trial and crucifixion. And I just could imagine in the devastation and the horror for the disciples and all of his followers as they just stood and watched Jesus being crucified. Well, those that still stuck around stood and watched me Jesus be crucified because we know that some fled for different reasons. Um, as they stood and watched their Lord their teacher, their friend, someone they've been following for three years, that they've been living with for three years, was, was um, put on trial and crucified. So we come to day seven. There's nothing much written about day seven because day seven was the Sabbath. So by Jewish tradition, it was a day of rest where they didn't do anything. So we've got no record of what they did on that particular day. Um, but then day eight. The resurrection well what we know is the resurrection but for them it was well a sun let's say a sunday for them it was just a sunday it was a day so it'd been a rather intense week for the disciples and the followers of jesus filled with both the highest of highs and the lowest of lows so john um in john chapter 20 19 he says that sunday evening disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Being that the crucifixion and they were aware was basically orchestrated through the political machinations of the Jewish leadership, who in cahoots with the Roman governing authorities, um, it's understandable that they were afraid. They were afraid for their own well-being, what was going to happen to them. They were confused. They would have been angry. Um, depression, they were upset. Uh, they were all very natural reactions for the disciples and I can't imagine that I would have reacted any differently. So they can be forgiven for choosing their own form of social distancing by deciding to lock themselves away for a little bit and deciding to just kind of come together and, and talk to themselves um, in what they hopefully for them, they felt where they felt safe. And so there was probably a lot of discussion during that meeting about what do they do next? Whether what they had experienced with Jesus was all for nothing. Well, because they had basically started what we would colloquially call a grassroots movement, which seemed to have been dealt a deadly blow by those in power. So they were probably sitting around wondering, what's next? Are we done? 
Do we just go home? Do we go back to our lives before? Do we keep going? Do we look for another religious leader? You know. And then Luke 24, verse 35, 36 says, Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognised him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling him, and just as they were telling him about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there amongst them. Peace be with you, he said. Now, this just could be the way that Luke framed that, that passage. But I like to imagine that Jesus literally appeared out of thin air. I mean, it was a locked room. He did point, um, John mentioned it was locked. And then Jesus just appeared in the, I mean, he's Jesus. Um, and then Jesus turned to them and said in verse 37, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me to make sure that I am not a ghost. Because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. As he spoke. He showed them his hands and his feet. Still, they stood there in disbelief, but filled with joy and wonder. And then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. So just think about that for a moment. They were there discussing what's going to do. They are afraid. Tensions would have been high. Emotions would have been boiling over. And I just had this picture in my mind of Jesus just sitting there, helping himself to the food while the, sta the, the disciples kind of stood there, dumbstruck, staring, frozen in total silence. I mean, Luke is making an important point here in this, in this moment that Jesus, he was actually there. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a mass hallucination. He was a physical being that they could touch that they could interact with. He ate and he ate with them. He was really there. They saw him die. They knew he was dead. And as um, a book I read, I think it's like the case of the Easter or something. I think it was Lee Strobel's book. He said, the Romans knew how to kill people. <laughs> they kind of like made a whole thing about it. So the Romans knew he was dead. Like he wasn't just faking it. He wasn't in a coma. He was really dead. Um, but this is three days later and he's there in front of them, eating with them, talking with him. They can touch him. He was there. Jesus goes on to explain to them that this is the fulfillment of prophecy in verse, um, from verse 44. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be filled, fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. Um, Luke continues, it, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. So Jesus doesn't just pop into this one meaning and go. I mean, if that just happened, you could probably, you know, there probably would be doubt. There probably would be um, questions in their minds. But Jesus stayed with them and appeared to other people around, around Jerusalem and around the time. Um, he also continued to teach them and teach other people. For the next 40 days, he was with them. For 40 days. Um, and during that time, the disciples learnt. They learnt from the feet of Jesus. They had been learning all this time, but they learnt more. They had a greater awareness and understanding of the scripture, of what the Bible meant. Well, not the Bible, but what the scriptures meant and, and what they taught and what they um, what Jesus and how Jesus was the Messiah. Um, 
So why they grew, why, why all they grew in their knowledge and understanding of scripture, Jesus also empowered them with a new mission and a new purpose. No longer did they need to lock themselves away in fear of what the Pharisees would do or the Jewish leaders would do or what the people would do. They were now freed, freed from their sins, freed from their peer, the, the fear and empowered to step into their God-given purpose. This is why we, as God's people, need to continue to spend time ourselves with God in his presence, in prayer, in his word, and with his people. I mean, God knows that we are social beings, and even, um, even the most introverted of us need to spend time with, some, with people. We are designed and we've been created to build communities and created to do life in community with one another. Even during times of global pandemic where we must um, lock ourselves away for a time, we are still designed to be in community. And isn't it a great thing that we live in, we're living in this age where we can still connect with one another, we can see each other face to face on through Zoom or through FaceTime or call people up on the, on, on the phone. We are have able to still connect as people of God. But God also knows that we cannot do this alone. He doesn't want us to do this in, in our own power. He doesn't want us to connect. He doesn't want us to witness in our own power. And he didn't want the disciples to do it on their own either. So he said the Holy Spirit which is the key. The disciples were not, they weren't alone. In fact, they were actually told to wait until the time was right in the city. And they did, but they weren't idle while they were waiting. They weren't just sitting in their homes, chilling and watching Netflix. They, were, they weren't just sitting back doing nothing. Um, Luke continues in verse 50. Jesus led them to Bethany and then lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. So they worshipped him and then returned to Jer Jerusalem, filled with great joy. And they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. So while they were waiting for God to, to act, for God to tell them that this is the right time, for God to give them the next step of their mission, they spent time praising and worshipping God. So... The question I think is, how is this part of Jesus' story and, and the disciples' story relevant for us today? So just like the disciples, we too find ourselves hidden away from the world. And when I say that, I'm not talking about we're right now in this moment hidden away because of a virus that's going through the community and we need to protect ourselves and, and the community um, from it. I'm talking about pre-COVID-19, sometimes we would find ourselves, even as God's people, hidden away, holding back, timid, maybe with some fear about um, sharing what we know and, and, and the love that we have for Jesus and, and our knowledge of, of who he is from the world because we're afraid of the reaction from the world. Um, I thought it was rather apt that uh, the, the video that David showed was based on 1 Timothy um, 1 7 which says um, I do not give you um, you're not given a spirit of fear or timidity, timidity rather that you are um, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity but of power love and self-discipline so even outside of our current situation my observation and both within myself but also within um, other Christians and churches that sometimes we can hold ourselves back of sharing the love of Christ with others because we're afraid of what people are going to think we're afraid we're going to be judged we're afraid that that um, people are going to think that we're judging them when we're not we just want them to understand the freedom that we have in Christ the freedom that they can have too because remember, we too are the witnesses for the work of Christ. We have called to share his love with the world, 
to share his joy, his peace and his story with the world. We don't have to worry about the consequences of our sharing. We just need to share. God will deal with the rest. And we, the church, we especially need to show God's love during times of crisis. And it, during times of crisis, and especially during this time, it is a great reminder that the church isn't the Sunday service. The church is not this building because I'm currently sitting in the church building. The, the church is not the building. The church is not the programs we put on. The church is us. We are the church. We can still share God's joy and love with the people that we do connect with, with our families, in our homes, in our communities. And during this time, we also can remember that we are not alone. God is with us. God is on the side, on our side. We have the Holy Spirit residing within us. He's our spiritual champion, urging us to, to follow him. And whenever we step out in faith, he's there alongside us. But we also have each other. We have our church family there to support one another together. The disciples weren't alone. They knew that they had each other to connect with. Um, they knew that they had one another to, um, as supporters and as fellow workers in the mission that God gave us. So as we close our service, I would like to pose a couple of questions for us to reflect on. So one is, what is causing you fear or anxiety right now? And how can the understanding of the risen Jesus help you? Another, another question is, is the Holy Spirit prompting you to witness to people you connect with? And what might that look like in today's environment? It's certainly not going to be catching up at the local coffee shop right now, but that doesn't stop our mission and our, our purpose. And the third question, are you continuing to worship and praise God for all that he does, has done and continues to do for you?